here's our agenda. We are in the final chapter of an accounting cycle. So if I asked you guys, could you list the steps in the accounting cycle, you should be able to do a pretty good job of listing the steps. Again, just like before, I'm not gonna ask you what's step four, for example, but I would expect you to know that the accounting cycle begins when we analyze transactions. And by the way, I'm not looking at my notes either. Um, and then the only way we can get transactions into the accounting system is through the journal entry process. And the journal entry does a great job of recording historical transactions as they occur. But the problem with the journal is that it didn't keep track of running balances. So we learned to post to the general ledger. And when we were done posting, we created this trial balance, which ensured that the debits equaled the credit. That was the start of that 10 column worksheet that we learned way back in chapter five. So we learned, and also in the last chapter, we brought the worksheet back that that worksheet is an internal document used to pull together all the adjustment data to give the owner a preview of his or her financial statements. And then we know that the only way those adjusting entries get into the accounting system is through the journal entry process. So that'll come up today. Um, and then what's still left to do is to report the operations to the users. And we do that through financial statements. And you might be saying, yeah, but we already covered financial statements. You're gonna see today, they are much different for merchandisers, especially the income statement. We're going from a puny five or six line income statement to what's called a multi-step income statement. And that's gonna be our first focus of attention today. And again, I would encourage you guys to use these agendas as checkoff lists for things that you're gonna see on the exam. So you guys are gonna have a 10 point test question that looks similar to one of the ones we'll be doing today on the multiple multi-step or multiple step income statement. Sometimes your book calls it classified income statement. So we're gonna start off by talking about that. And because it can be so overwhelming, when you look at the statement, it may be 35 lines long or so. Um, there's no way that this brain anyways can memorize 35 lines. And so what I do is I break it down into chunks and I try and remember the chunks from previous chapters. So we're gonna take the pieces apart. In fact, I wrote the pieces down here. This is what I call the bare bones or the skeleton format of an income statement. So if you, were asked, if you were to ask me, what does an income state look at, look like? I would list these six chunks. I would tell you, and we're gonna look at this in just a second, that the very first chunk is the net sales, which literally means sales after discounts. We did that in chapter seven. And the second and hardest chunk, the one that we really have to work on is cost of goods sold. And what I would tell you on that, and we've mentioned this in a previous chapter, that is the chunk that calculates the cost of goods bought or purchased and adjusts it for inventory to give us the cost of goods sold. That is the most challenging part of the income statement. So having said that, I would focus a little bit of extra attention on that chunk called cost of goods sold. We're gonna look at it in a second. The difference between these first two chunks is called gross profit. And we're gonna learn it as a number and we're gonna learn it as a percentage. And that answers this question. How much did the company make just selling the goods before any other costs of running the operation are considered? How much did the company make just in selling the goods? We'll do it as a number and as a percentage. The rest of it is easy stuff because we've all been learning about all these different expenses during the year. Things like payroll tax expense and depreciation expense and all these expenses that we've been building in our vocabulary. The only thing that happens down here is we're gonna split them up between two major types that you should have read about. Selling expense are gonna be those expenses that are used in the selling process Things like commission expense, advertising expense. The reason that we advertise is because we're trying to sell. And then the second category we often refer to as GNA, which stands for general and administrative. Those are the non-selling expenses. 
there's this little other section that gap mandates that we put in it's called other and it mostly will be devoted to interest and then finally just like the last line of a of a service oriented business is net income on the income statement that's always the goal on any income statement of what we're after was the company profitable or not so our focus today is mainly going to be on that multi-step income statement the good news is the statement of owner's equity has not changed at all it looks exactly the same as it looked on day two of the class and then we'll touch upon the balance sheet also and instead of using a traditional balance sheet we're going to learn about a classified balance sheet today and then we'll save these ratios for next time. That'll be something that we cover in day two. So that's kind of a preview of where we're headed. Um, my hope is that chapter 12 is almost done. We'll have to go back and check the schedule to see what the due date is because I don't remember. But I know that we should be finishing up chapter 12. And then all we have left to do this week, if you pushed ahead like I encouraged you guys to do over the weekend, then let's focus on one chapter, chapter 13. And we take our test and after a, I would say very quick semester, I know for some of you it seemed long because it's been so much work, but you've done it in a very short time period and you're just right there at the finish line. So we got to keep pushing ourselves further. Um, and I think it was, was it the Tour de France where I saw a bunch of bikes uh, stumble over each other. We don't want that to happen. We don't want to stumble in the final stretch. That's where we're headed. Let me stop for a minute. See if you guys have any questions on what's left or what's ahead. Anybody? Okay, then I wanted to show you the handout page because here's what I'm going to be opening today. You guys should have the handout open. You should have the multi-step income statement and balance sheet. I'll be referring to those. So I would have those open. And then at some point when we go to the exercises, we're going to be using this Excel template. You'll want to download that when we do our first real live income statement. So I'm in the modules link. I'm all the way at the bottom in the chapter 13 handouts. Um, we'll be taking a look at most of these today. So if you haven't yet downloaded them, while I'm starting to talk about the chapter, it would be wise to get these opened. Um, as I was explaining to my mom this weekend, windows is called that. It means you can have lots of open windows at the same time and you can scroll back and forth between them. All right, so here's that first handout. Um, looking at the title, and you guys always have permission to interrupt me. You can either raise your little blue hand if you want, or you can just unmute yourself and ask away. So if, I, if I'm going too fast or you need me to repeat something or you didn't quite catch something, don't wait until the end. Ask me as we go. Uh, first thing I wanna point out, we will not cover reversing entries. So in your notes, don't bother troubling yourself about reversing entries. There are, no longer used too often. And so I'm not gonna hold you responsible for those. You can cross off that section in your book. And so if you haven't noticed yet on my handouts, I always try and take a look back on where we've been. And then I try and take a look forward. So we're almost finished learning a complete accounting cycle for a merchandisers. We've learned how to record buy and sell transactions. We talked about the adjustment process. We know how to do a worksheet. So now we're left with the summarizing process of the accounting function. So in a nutshell, what this chapter covers are the three financial statements. Okay, the income statement is gonna be the most radically different. The statement of owner's equity has not changed a lick. And then the balance sheet's gonna be bigger. Okay, but the main focus here is gonna be on the income statement. And then the second chunk of what we'll be working on is the closing process. And the good news is we already know how to close. We're gonna have a little bit of a tweak on the closing process, but we know why we do closing entries. We know that one time at the end of the fiscal year, there's four closing entries and the goal is to wipe out the accounts. We're gonna have one little curveball thrown at us when we get there. But for the most part, the closing process is the same. 
So where we're headed in this chapter is we're gonna cover the three financial statements, okay, just like we said. We're gonna talk about the closing entries, which I think are gonna be a piece of cake for you if you understood it when we talked about it previously. And then we're gonna do some ratios. And I'm not sure why your author didn't devote a section to that, um, but we're gonna be doing some ratios. We'll do those tomorrow. So here's where we are. We know what financial statements are. We know that there are three of them. There's actually four, but in this class we're working on three. And they're prepared in the same order that we're used to. It's just that in the past, we've done this for a service oriented firm. And now our focus is on a merchandiser. And so it says, see separate handout of the skeleton based multi-step income statement. And those are the other handouts that I encourage you guys to open at the start of class. So the income statement is the most radically different financial statement out of the three. And again, it's probably 30 plus lines long. There's no possible way we can memorize that. And so what I do is break it down into what I call the skeleton format. So on the agenda, you saw each one of these line items highlighted. And that's because I look at this as, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six or so, six to seven separate and distinct components. So I can't memorize 35 lines, but I can remember what this looks like. I know that the first chunk of my income statement is to compute how much came in from the sales process. It's called net because just like our net pay is what we receive after the deductions have been taken out, net sales is the sales after those two contra accounts are taken out. Sales returns and allowances and sales discounts. I think that chunk is going to be a piece of cake for you guys. The hardest chunk, the one that we're really going to work on today, is cost of goods sold. That S is important. Cost of goods sold. Not bought. That's what we did in Chapter 8. We did cost of goods purchased. We're going to change that into cost of goods sold. Why is it any big deal? Because GAP says that we have to follow the matching principle which says you have to record the related revenues here in net sales um, with expenses from the same period recorded as well. So this doesn't say net bought, it says net sales. And so what we have to figure out is what was the expense? What was the cost of goods sold? How much did we spend on buying all those goods that we eventually sold the customers? The difference between these two is the profit that you made just on selling the goods. So gross profit is one of the most important numbers out there right now for many businesses, not just in dollars, but in percentages. In fact, I don't hardly ever watch TV, but this weekend I was with my mom and she was, I don't know, doing something with her neighbors. And so I was flipping around and some of you may have watched Shark Tank, I think is what it's called. And every single episode of Shark Tank that I've watched, the sharks always ask them, what's your gross margin? What's your gross profit? It's this number they're talking about. It's what they make just from selling the goods before the cost of operating the facility is mentioned. How much profit do you make just on the goods sold? We're gonna learn it as we do it today um, with numbers, dollars, and we're also going to learn it as a percentage, which is what the sharks often ask. What's your gross profit percentage? After that, this is a piece of cake because all the expenses that we've been learning about are categorized into one of two spaces. And you heard me mention that on the agenda. It's either a selling expense if it had to do with a sales process or it's a general and administrative expense. So we're just going to list those in the proper category. GAP says you got to compute your net income before some other items. And I use quotes around it because GAP is very specific about what goes in this other section. Um, typically, it's relegated to interest, either interest income or interest expense. So interest always goes in this other item. 
And then if a company were to generate revenue from something other than the sales, it would go here in the other income. So let me give you an example. I think I may have mentioned this during class. I've been to Target headquarters in Minneapolis, right? Target buys and sells goods like most other merchandisers. 99.5% of their revenue comes from selling their goods. But Target owns this little golf course in Minnesota where their corporate headquarters are. And because it owns a golf course, it has a little bit, just a teeny bit of golf course income. Okay, that's not a normal part of merchandising, having a golf course. And so you wouldn't include that golf course income up in net sales. That's not what Target is in the business of doing. But instead, that little itty bit of golf course income would be classified here under the other category. And again, all interest costs go here as well. Um, the goal of every income statement on the face of the earth is to calculate net income or net loss. So this is what I refer to as the bare bones. This is what I tell my accounting 101 and 102 class. You got to remember this because every income statement is going to come down to a format very similar to this. So our challenge today is going to be to work on each chunk of that income statement because you guys have a 10 point test question on your exam four, which is going to ask you to prepare a multi step income statement. So that's where we're headed today. I think we're going to probably just jump in, uh, talk about the income statement and then similar to many other things that we do in this class, we'll jump in and get our hands dirty. So our first focus today is going to be, can we nail down this multi-step, which literally means multiple or many, this many step income statement? Any questions from anybody? Okay, this is the format we're going for. And as I mentioned, don't get overwhelmed with the 30 plus lines or so. What I would do is break it down into chunks and you'll see that on your handout, I've put these chunks off to the right. So I don't try and remember these first three lines. I remember what goes into the net sales chunk. Okay, sales less the two contra accounts gives you net sales. The tougher part, the hardest part, I think. Cost of goods not bought. Cost of goods sold. So net delivered cost of purchases here. Here's the cost of everything you bought. That's not what we're after. That's part of it. That goes back to chapter eight. Now we got to tweak it with the inventories. And in the last chapter, chapter 12, I made a big deal about that inventory adjustment. I didn't want you shortcutting the inventory adjustment. Instead, we did it in two steps. We took out the old and we put in the new. Here's why. We need to add the beginning inventory in here and take out the ending inventory. And people always ask, why is that subtracted? Everything on this income statement, it's pretty much added. There's few subtractions. Why is that ending inventory subtracted? Remember, it's the cost of goods sold sold. Well, if stuff is sitting on the floor, you haven't sold it. That $47,000 worth of merchandise is what the company still has left. That's why it's subtracted out. And we get this biggest number on here. We're going to practice in just a sec second called cost of goods sold. So here's the first two chunks off to the right. Operating revenue, what I call net sales, and then cost of goods sold. And the difference between these two is one of the most important numbers in all of financial accounting. It's called gross profit. In dollars here, this is the example in your book, it's over 200,000. We're also going to do it as a percentage. That's what you hear these sharks asking all these potential business leaders. What's your gross profit margin? So we're going to turn that into percentages as well. From here on down, it's easy. All the expenses that you've been learning about are gonna be classified into one of two categories. 
it's either a selling expense, which means it's related to the sales process, or it's a general and administrative. So it's gonna go in one of those two categories. We'll total them up. We'll calculate this gap mandated net income from operations. Another key word for that is how much did you generate before financing costs came into play? And the rest of this chunk is what we call the other section, gap mandates that interest goes down there. So you'll see that this company had some interest income and it also had some interest expense and any other kind of what I call weird revenue that wasn't generated in the normal ordinary sales process would go here. In this case, you see they have some miscellaneous income, a couple hundred dollars. And our goal as with every income statement is to calculate net income. So I know that looks a little bit overwhelming we're gonna jump in and get our feet wet or our hands dirty here shortly and show you that as long as we can break it into chunks, we got this, whether it's for Accounting 100 that we're wrapping up right now or looking forward into your 101 class that I hope most of you will be taking in the fall, we can do this. So let me stop because I've been talking for a long time. Any questions on that multi-step income statement? Anything you see that you're not quite sure about before we jump in and try one? Okay, then let's go jump in and try this. This is the Excel files for day one that I hope you guys have downloaded. You'll see it on my screen here. We're gonna start off by identifying what chunk each line item goes into, and then we'll jump in and we'll actually do a real life multi-step income statement, probably the first one that you've done. Um, will it be easy? No, it will not be easy. So what I would expect from this first problem is multiple choice questions. So here's what a multiple choice question would look like. I'm gonna take this first example. It would say something like, the account purchases returns and allowances would be long in which section of the income statement? And then your multiple choice would say, A, operating revenue, B, cost of goods sold, C, operating expense, D, other income, E, other expense. Kind of like you see up here, you'll be asked multiple choice questions on where do they belong? Okay, well, anything related to the buying side, anything that was in that net delivered cost of purchases that we looked at in the previous chapter, chapter eight, I think it was, anything on the buying side is part of this cost of goods sold. So rather than listing A through E, I wanna make a connection with your brain on which section that should show up in. So I'm gonna use these abbreviations that I've put off to the right. That's going to stick with you a whole lot more than A, B, C, D, or E. So our choices are in yellow here. We're going to go through each line item and decide which chunk of that income statement it goes in. So before I do this problem, any questions on the directions? So my guess is I would say there's probably about 10 to 20 points in terms of multiple choice questions that's gonna ask where these different things are located. So this is one that I would go back and do after we do it in class, go try it on your homework without your notes, just to see how well you absorbed it. Of course, in Connect, it's gonna tell you with, if you're right or wrong. So if you miss it, go back and look at the account and make sure you can understand which section it goes in because on the test, you won't have that little check my work button. You don't have that luxury. On the test, you're doing it for the 100 points assessment to see whether you understood the materials that we've talked about. All right, telephone expense. Well, that's an operating expense. So I'm gonna go ahead and list that section. Remember when you get to operating expenses later, they'll ask you to further classify it as either a selling or a general and administrative. That would be a GNA, right? Sales, anything related to the sales process is going to be in the operating revenue section. It's going to be up there when we calculate net sales. It's in that first chunk. Purchases, anything related to the buying side is going to be in cost of goods sold. It is the largest expense item 
and our whole income statement, which reminds me, get into the habit of we're keeping that long list. I hope you've been adding to it. I expect you guys to know three things about every account, the type of account. Okay. You got five categories, asset, liability, equity, revenue, or expense, the normal balance and what financial statement it goes on. I would expect you to know those three things about every account that we've learned. And by the way, if you have been keeping a list, you're going to carry that into whatever teacher you have for accounting 101. They're going to expect the same. All right, interest. As soon as you see interest, you're in that other section, gap mandates, that interest be set aside. So you got two choices now. You're either in other income or other expense. This would be other income since it's interest. Merchandise inventory, both the beginning and ending balances are used in cost of goods sold. Both the beginning and ending balances are used in that cost of goods sold calculation. We're going to go do one shortly. Interest expense. Once again, interest is by definition, by gap in the other section. So we're left with these two choices. That would be an other expense. The sales goes in the revenue section where we calculate net sales. Depreciation expense is one of those operating expenses that we've been learning about as we go. By the way, if the question was to ask you which section of operating expenses, if you see the word store, that would mean that it is a selling expense. So this one didn't ask us. I'm just helping you prep for what's ahead. If you see the word store in any account name, store equipment, store supplies expense, if you see the word store, it's a selling expense because the store is the physical facility where the goods are sold. If I were to walk into the Target store, that's where they're doing their selling. And then rent expense is an operating expense. Sales discounts, that's one of those accounts that we learned about when we first started talking about merchandisers, it's, it's up in the chunk where we calculate net sales. Questions on one through 11, any of those that you need re-explained or that don't make too much sense to you? All right, supplies expense would be in the operating expense. Freight in, this is often missed, so I'm gonna highlight it. Freight in is one of those accounts that we learned about in the buying side of the house. Freight in means on incoming merchandise. That's what we pay when we're buying the goods. So that goes in costs of goods sold. For some reason, people think it's an operating expense. That's why I highlighted it. Purchases discounts had to do with the buying process. That goes in costs of goods sold. An uncollectible accounts expense is a regular cost of doing business or regular operating expense. So that's the first one. I would encourage you guys to take a double take, do a double look on this because you will see lots of multiple choice questions related to how accounts are classified. Questions on that first one. Okay. Here goes a 10 point test question. So someplace on your notes, this is a 10 point test question. So this is one that I would take a definite look at. Um, our job is to do a multi-step income statement. You'll also notice that the author keeps going back and calling this a classified income statement. Um, Kind of weird wording on his part. We almost always hear to it referred to as a multi-step. So you might want to put that in parentheses just to build your vocabulary. This is multi-step or many steps. And you can see how it gets its name. 
So it gives us a bunch of accounts and they even tell us, if we read this carefully, they're gonna tell us what expense items are considered selling expenses. I wish they would have left that to you to figure out, but we're gonna read this. It says the worksheet of Lance Office Supplies contains the following revenue cost and expense accounts. Prepare a classified income statement. And then they tell you here is the beginning inventory right here. The merchandise inventory at the beginning of the year was this. We're gonna need that in cost of goods sold. That's my beginning inventory. And it was this amount at the end of the year. That's ending inventory. Okay, so they give us beginning inventory and ending inventory. Okay, now listen to this because you guys, to avoid the emails, I never mind emails from you guys. I've probably answered 50 of them this weekend. I never mind emails. But there is another test question. Um, I shouldn't say test. There's another homework question where they don't explicitly give you the inventory numbers, but they'll leave the income statement, sorry, income summary account. They'll give it to you there. So be careful. There is a homework question where they won't explicitly list the inventory items for beginning and ending inventory but they will give you the income summary account as a line item. The debit's the beginning inventory and the credit is the ending inventory. So I'll probably get five or six emails saying, I don't know how to calculate cost of goods sold because I don't see the inventory amounts. And my answer is gonna be, go take a look at the income summary account, they're there. They're not explicit like in this question where he just lists them out but they're implicit, they're in the account balances. You need to go find them. And then I'm gonna read his hint. It says the expense account numbers from 611 to 617 are selling expenses. So what he just said is from 611 to 617, these are selling expenses. And I'm gonna go back and read his hint again. And then he says everything from 631 to 646, 631 to 646 here, these are general and administrative expenses. And our goal is to complete a multiple step income statement. That one that's 20 to 30 lines long. This is a 10 point test question. Well, what I'm gonna do and what I would do on a test I'm gonna chicken scratch this out by chunks. And if I can chicken scratch it out by chunks, and I know what each chunk should add up to, then I can figure out my net income before I worry about, does it go in this column or that column? Do I need a dollar sign? Do I not need a dollar sign? I'm gonna chicken scratch this out. Okay, and then we'll go do the formal financial statement that this problem's looking for. So let me stop for a second, see if you guys have any questions on the directions and then we'll proceed. Anybody have any questions? All right, chunk one, net sales. Okay, sales less the two contra accounts. The two contra accounts for sales that we learned about in chapter seven was sales returns and allowances and sales discounts. This company doesn't offer any sales discounts because it's not up here where the rest of the revenue accounts would be. So chunk one is net sales, calculate it. Not nice and neat, just chicken scratching. We're gonna calculate net sales. And net sales is sales less the returns and allowances. So I'm gonna get my calculator out and I'm gonna take the difference between those two and that's my first chunk, net sales. So you guys do it with me. I got 261,600. That is my net sales. That is chunk one. Miscellaneous income, that's going to go down with the other income because it's not income generated by the sales uh, process. So I'm going to put a little OI out there for other income. The hardest chunk to do, 
cost of goods sold, all the buying accounts that we learned about are included in cost of goods sold. So I'm going to put some circles or a half circle around all those buying accounts and remember what cost of goods sold was. It was the, the what we learned back in chapter eight, the net delivered cost of purchases that should look be somewhere in your memory bank, tweaked for inventory. The net delivered cost of purchases tweaked for inventory. Okay, well, let me get the net delivered cost of purchases first. I got two debits here and two credits. I'm gonna net these. In other words, on my calculator, I'm taking purchases of 108,600, that first number, and I'm adding in the freight, 1975. And now I'm gonna take out these two contras. I'm gonna back out 1600, and I just messed up, so give me a second. Minus 1600 and minus 1800. That's gonna give me the net delivered cost of purchases. I'm going to wait for a second for you guys to get it. I got 105.175, but I'm going to wait because I don't want anybody guessing. One more time how I got that is 108.600 plus the freight. I'm going to subtotal that. Now I'm up to 110.575. And now I'm going to take out those two contras, take out the purchase returns and allowances and take out the purchases discounts and 105, 175. Questions. Okay, then I'm going to tweak it for inventory. What do you mean tweak it for inventory? I'm going to add in my beginning inventory and I'm going to take out my ending inventory. Why would we take out the ending inventory? Because it's not sold. It's sitting on the floor. It has value to it. And so we back that out. What we're after is the hardest chunk now called cost of goods sold. Remember, I'm going to show you all this in detail. Whoops. All of this in detail when I do the actual income statement itself. But for now, when I add in that beginning inventory at the top and I take out the ending inventory, what I'm left with is cost of goods sold. This is the hardest chunk by far. And that's what I got. I'm going to wait a second and see if you get that. Then the difference between these two, between net sales and cost of goods sold is gross profit. One of the most sought after numbers in all of accounting. I mentioned I was looking at Shark Tank Every single time they asked the entrepreneur that was coming to sell their idea, every single time they asked them for the gross profit margin. So we have net sales and we have cost of goods sold. Gross profit in dollars is the difference between these two. So I'm going to get my calculator out and I'm going to take the difference between those two. That is my gross profit in dollars. While we're talking about that, I'm going to turn that into a percentage. It's called the gross profit margin. Okay, so we know what the gross profit is in dollars, but they never ask for dollars. They want to know what is, what is your margin? How much profit are you making just on the goods that you sell? So here's how you compute it. It's the gross profit. Oh, for some reason, that was a small line item. Let me make this bigger so you guys can see it. It is the gross profit 
divided by the net sales. So I'm going to take my gross profit. I'll write it down what I do for your notes. 149,375 divided by that net sales. So that's what it looks like in numbers. And then when I actually put that into my calculator, when I take the 149,375 and I divide by the net sales, I got, and this is expressed as a percentage, so I'm going to click percent and add a couple decimal places. I got about 57%. Okay, what does that mean? This company's generating a 57% profit margin just on selling their sales. You might be asking yourself, well, does that mean they're going to be profitable in the end? In the United States, that needs to be about 35% or higher in order for the company to be profitable. So it looks promising. We'll finish this income statement and see whether they generated enough sale to not just cover the cost of the stuff they sold, but all their expenses here momentarily. Any questions on that? All right, so we're chicken scratching this out. We have our chunks, we have net sales, we have the hardest one, cost of goods sold. We just did the difference, gross profit, and what we're doing right now, I'm kind of refreshing your memory, here's what we're doing. We're taking these line items, we're doing these chunks piece by piece. We have net sales, we have cost of goods sold, the hardest one, we have gross profit, so now what's left Let's figure out what our operating expenses are and eventually figure out what our net income is. So that's where we're headed. So going back to our chicken scratching, he told us in the beginning that these three are selling expenses. Let me go add that up. 45,300 plus 2310. This is why I don't use my calculator too much. I transpose. So let's see if we got it. 49,120 is what I got for my selling expenses. The rest of these are general and administrative, except for that last line was interest. So quickly go add those up. I'm using my calculator. We're adding up those line items that the author told us were the general and administrative expenses. I got 47,890, let me go check. Let's see if that's right. Yes, 47,890. And finally, 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 we're ready to see whether we were profitable. They have two other categories. They had other income above. Remember that other income was 400. And they have this other expense, which is 740. This is interest expense, 740. And so our goal is to come up with, were they profitable? Did they make net income? Well, so far we have this gross profit. Right, so building on that, we just computed that we have operating expenses equal to the sum of these two chunks, selling and G&A. When I add those two chunks up, I got 97,010. Okay, that is these two. That's the cost of running their business. So now I'm to my income from operations section, which is just the difference between these two. So let me do that on my calculator. I'm left with 52,365. So, so far we're very profitable. And after I consider these two chunks, these last two other items, one pulled me up, the other income, and one pulled me down. So let me 
get rid of that slash. Here's our other section, gap mandates what goes in there. One pulled us up, one pulled us down. So I'm gonna put less so you don't get confused. Finally, 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 we're chicken scratching this out. The last profit I calculated for our company here was 52,365 before these two minor items. One 400 pulled us up, added. One, the cost of the financing pulled us down. When I compute that, I'm chicken scratching out right now. I know that my net income when everything's said and done is 52,025. So this company was profitable to the tune of 52,000. We had theorized that it would be because that gross profit margin was in the high 50s and they indeed were. So now our goal and the 10 point test question is gonna say, do a formal income statement. Okay, well, that's where I want you to download those forms that I showed you earlier. So let me stop for a second because I know you must have questions and then I'll show you where the form I want you to download is. Is there anything you see up there and you don't understand how a number was derived? All right, let me show you where this form is that I want you to uh, download so we can do this together. It's in the modules link. You'll scroll all the way to the very bottom to chapter 13. Let me wait for my computer to catch up. And it's in the 13 handouts. And it's this blank financial statement template. So modules link all the way to the bottom is chapter 13. I want you to download this blank financial statement template and I've already downloaded it. So it's gonna look like this. So we just did chicken scratching, right? We have all this chicken scratching going on. We know what our final result's gonna be. In fact, we know what each chunk is because we did the chunks by hand, quick and dirty. Now we have to make it a nice, neat, formal income statement. Remember that these formal income statements go out to external users as well as internal users. So we don't care what our chicken scratching looks like. That was for us. We do care what a formal income statement that's going to go out to others looks like. So I'm ready to throw that together. And I'm going to do that on the template that hopefully you've downloaded. So remember, everything has a three-part heading, who, what, and when. So I'm gonna type this in. This is Lance Office Supplies. This is an income statement. And like all income statements, you have to define the period of time. So I got my who, what, when. Remember, there is never debits and credits on financial statements. There's just columns to put the numbers in. Now, let me put your fears to rest. It doesn't matter what column you choose to put these numbers in. In other words, Giselle might put numbers in the first column and Lolly might put them in the middle column and Jason and Brandy might decide just to put them in the last column. It doesn't matter the columns are there for you to make the numbers flow. However, that works out. Um, they're used as a way to help with the math mechanics. Don't worry about, does this go on the first column or the last column? Not important. Okay, so first chunk is called operating revenue. And this is the chunk where we calculate our net sales. Okay, how do you do it? Okay, I know what that chunk means because I've had to do so many of these. It's sales less the two contras, sales returns and allowances, and sales discounts. Now, some of you may be saying, well, you just said we didn't have sales discounts. We didn't, but I'm going to put it in there because I'm more concerned about the upcoming test and about your long-term success in Accounting 101 
that I'm going to make this generic enough so that it will fit any company. And again, I don't care what column you use. I'll start off on the right up here and I'll put my sales up there. So my sales were 265,950. This is coming from our chicken scratching. And we did have sales returns and allowances, 4350. And we did not have any sales discount. So I'm going to put a zero in there. So the total subtractions, I only have the one number I'm going to subtract out. That's how I am down to my first chunk called net sales. Okay, we already know what net sales is. We chicken scratched it in. Now we're doing it nice and neat and it's really hard to see the total line. So I'll write them in. My first chunk, net sales. How much did you take? How much did you generate in sales after the contra accounts? Okay, this goes back to chapter seven. That's not new. Pulling it all together is new. Questions on the first chunk of our income statement. We'll worry about dollar signs at the end. Right now, I want you to follow the math. Second and hardest chunk, cost of goods sold. This is the hardest chunk. Okay, well, in a nutshell, what this is, it's the cost of goods purchased, okay, the net cost of goods purchased, tweaked for inventory. So I'm going to start off with my beginning inventory. And that would be the inventory that was existed on January 1st first of 2000 X one. I'm going to go use my middle set of columns now so we can start another little math trail here. Remember the author gave us that in the wording of the first exercise. Let me go show you right here. He gave us beginning inventory and ending inventory. That won't always be the case to avoid a bunch of emails. Sometimes he may give it to you in the income summary account, but he just explicitly gave it to us right here. So 59,775, got to remember that. 59,775. Now here comes the part that I should remember from chapter eight, the net delivered cost of purchases. I can't remember all that words. Here's what I think. The cost of all the stuff you bought, right? It's the cost of all the stuff you bought. So go look at your buying accounts. We had purchases. And what goes hand in hand with purchases is the freight in. And I'm going to add those two up. I'm going to go use this other column to help me with that. So the purchases were 108,600. And it cost me some money to get the purchases here. Get focused again. Here's my purchases. That's what I bought. Here's my freight. That's how much it took to get it to me. This is what we learned as the delivered cost of purchases. When I add that up, okay, I'll put a total line in because they're hard to see on this format. Um, now what I need to do is take out the two contra accounts that we learned about in purchases. So I'm going to take out less my purchases discounts and less my purchase returns and allowances. Doesn't matter what order you put them in. I'll use the same thing I used on sales in terms of the order. So I'll take out less the purchases returns and allowances and less the purchases discounts. Looking at your accounts that we chicken scratched on, the returns and allowances were 3,600 and the discounts were 1,800. So I'm gonna take those out. There is usually no minus signs on an income statement unless there's a net loss. So some of you might be saying, hey, why don't you put those in brackets? Your author doesn't put them in brackets. I'm trying to be consistent with how he does it. So we'll call this the net delivered cost 
of purchases. And that is your calculation from chapter eight. One hundred five, one seventy five, I think is what we got when we chicken scratched it. That calculation right there is from chapter eight. The new part is tweaking it for inventory. So I added in my beginning inventory and what I need to do is take out my ending inventory. This is called merchandise available for sale. What that means is if you would have sold everything in the whole store, here's what it would have cost you. So you add in your beginning inventory and you add in the net delivered cost of purchases. I think I'm gonna put it over here in the same column. Again, columns don't matter. You can put them in whatever column you want. So now comes taking out the ending inventory that was given to us at the very top of the problem as 52725. And finally, 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 once I do the math, I have the hardest chunk done. Okay, here's the math. Take your available for sale and take out that ending inventory we have this number on our chicken scratching, so we know that we're on the right track. This section, which I'm gonna make yellow in a minute, is the hardest section. It's gonna show us or gonna lead to how much profit we made just by selling the goods. And it's the difference, I'm gonna use some color here, between the two green numbers. Okay, so let me stop. That's a lot of stuff. Taking it back to the basics, what did we just do? We took that chapter eight calculation and the only difference we did is we added in the beginning inventory, I'll put it in yellow, and we took out the ending inventory. So it's nothing really different from what we did in chapter eight, except that now it's being tweaked for inventory. This is why I made a big deal in chapter 12 about keeping those two inventory numbers intact. We made a big deal about don't take a shortcut. You need both the beginning inventory here and the ending inventory here to calculate this cost of goods sold. So now we have the first two chunks, those green numbers. Our gross profit is the difference between the green numbers. Here's the profit that we made just on selling the goods. I'm gonna take it a step further, okay? Cause I know what's ahead and I know what's on the test. I'm gonna calculate this as a percentage. We already did it on our chicken scratching but it never hurts to do it again. We're gonna do a gross profit margin. I'm gonna come out to the side and chicken scratch that out. What is your gross profit margin? We did it earlier. The way you get this is by taking gross profit and dividing by net sales. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna take that gross profit what we just calculated, and I'm gonna divide by net sales, that first chunk. And we did this in class. I'm gonna make this bigger so you can see it. I also wanted to do it a second time because it's an important part of this chapter. Let me get this in a percent format with a couple decimal places and make the column bigger so you can see it. This company has made 57% profit just on what it sold before all the other costs of operating the business are done. Sharks on the shark tank like to see this above 50%. And the United States, it needs to be right around 35% or higher to be profitable. This company is doing well so far with those kind of margins. 
it's easy after this. All we got to do is take out the expenses, classify them properly, and worry about that other section. So this is by far the hardest part of the income statement. So let me stop because this is the hardest part. I would expect you guys to have lots of questions. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but where did you get the gross profit number from? The 149,375, is that the one you're asking about? Yes. It's the difference between the two green numbers. So in words, it would be net sales, less cost of goods sold. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Anybody else? Good question. All right, now we're still, remember our goal, big picture. Was the company profitable or not? That's what the income statement shows. So far, so good. They're above a standard gross profit margin, so they're looking good. Now we're going to consider the cost of operating the business. So we call this operating expenses. And your author helped us out. He said, we have two categories, selling expenses and then the general and administrative expenses. And so he told us which of those expenses were considered selling expenses. And if we go look at our chicken scratching, I think we had three of them. So again, to help us just kind of with the math and with also the indentations, I'm just indenting to help set these apart. I don't care where your indentations are either. If you know what goes on an income statement and you can derive net income, I am a happy, happy teacher. I don't care if it's in the first column or third column or that you're doing indenting one way or the other. I don't care about that. I care on, can you do a multi-step income statement? The hardest part's done. So he gave us three selling expenses. He said we have salaries expense for the salespeople and we have store supplies expense. Store is a magic word. If you see the word store, it's gonna be a selling expense. And we have depreciation expense for the store. There's that word again, store. Pick a column, doesn't matter to me. I'll use the first one. And I'll list those three expenses that he gave us. And now I can add these up. There's my total selling expenses. Again, knowing that it's tough to show the lines in Excel, I'm handwriting them in. We already added up that chunk when we did our chicken scratching. And then the other chunk is called general and administrative, what you will commonly refer, we hear referred to as GNA. In fact, in QuickBooks, I think they even use GNA. And that was most of the rest of the expenses with the exception of interest. So I'm going to type those in and then I'll go put the numbers in. We had rent. We had utilities. We had salaries expense, but this time it was for the office people. Payroll taxes expense. Depreciation expense on the office equipment. And uncollectible accounts expense. I'm gonna wait, because I know you may not type as quickly. Pick a column, doesn't matter which column. I'm going to go to the first one again. We already did a total for ourselves, so we should match up to our chicken scratching earlier. Again, I'm going to wait. I think we had six of them. I wanna make sure I didn't forget anything. And I'll total these up. 
and we'll check it with our chicken scratching. I think it matches. So the total cost of running the business would be the sum of those two categories. Again, I'm going to use some color to help me explain where numbers are coming from. So if I look at those blue numbers, that's the total cost of me running the business. The top half was what I made selling just the goods. The bottom half is what did it take me to operate the store to in order to be able to sell these goods. So I'm going to call this total operating expenses. And it's the sum of the blue numbers. Here's what it took to operate the store 97,010. Then what comes next will be the most often omitted number for both, well, for all three, 100, 101, and 102 students. The most often omitted number that GAP requires us to put is called income from operations. It is before that other section. Okay, GAP wants financing costs out of the mix. They want it, they want that in a separate section. So what did they make just on running this business before financing costs are considered? And to help, because Henri had a really good question earlier to help see where these numbers are coming from, I'm gonna put some more color. That 52,365 there is the difference between these two orange numbers. And all we have left to go is the other section that GAP requires us to have. So I want to take a second and stop. Give you guys a chance to ask questions. Now you get the idea, I think, why it's called multi-step. There's been lots of steps. It is multiple steps. It's no longer just the revenues, less the expenses, like we got spoiled with on the um, service provider, like a barber or a physical therapist or a personal trainer. Now we're in the business of buying and selling goods and it gets a lot more involved. By the way, you'll spend the first couple of chapters in Accounting 101 going back over this. So what's left to polish us off, to finish us off, are those two other categories. So we did have an other income, right? Again, pick a column. It doesn't matter what number this goes into. That was that $400 of miscellaneous. I should actually put that on a line item by itself. Let me call this miscellaneous income. And then we also had an other expense that was interest. And then we're going to net these two. So one pulls us up the 400, one pulls us down. Your book's going to call this net non operating expense. Okay, the difference between these two. The reason it's an expense is because that expense here was bigger. And that net expense would be 340. Where we got that is the difference between these two. And finally, 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 what we were after in the first place was net income. I'm going to add some color. It is the difference between these two yellow numbers. We calculated our net, our net income before we started. So right now we're checking ourselves to see whether we match up. 
that does match our chicken scratching. That is a very long multi-step income statement. Um, again, the reason I allowed you guys to use your book and use your notes, because I do realize that we did this in a very fast manner. We're going at the speed of light. We're covering in 13 chapters. We're doing 13 chapters in six weeks where regular semester class takes 18 weeks. So it went incredibly fast. That's why I'm allowing you to use your books and notes just to kind of take some of the pressure off that we all feel, including myself as a student, that I feel during final exam time. I'm getting ready to take a nasty final um, this weekend also. Nasty final. And I'm studying my tail off. And the nerves, I do understand how the nerves can get the better of you. I do know what it feels like to hyperventilate because you're so scared to take a test. All kinds of signs that we need to work on. Um, some people meditate. My personal preference as a student, I make myself as possible, prepare it as much as possible by practicing to take down the level of anxiety by the time I get to the test. <laughs> How do I do that? I have three four-hour study sessions set up this week to devote to studying, just complete studying. I'm going to put a sign up that says no entrance. I don't want my husband or anybody else bugging me during those times. I want to devote them just to studying for this final that I have looming over my head. Last thing I'm going to show you on this income statement. We did a gross profit percentage up here. I'm going to show you a net profit percentage. While we're on the topic of an income statement, the net profit percentage is net income divided by net sales. Okay, if you look above, the gross profit percentage was gross profit divided by net sales. So it makes sense that the net profit is net income divided by net sales. So I'm gonna take that 52,025 and divide by my net sales up here, that first chunk is green. What the heck does that mean? It means that after everything's said and done, well, after all the expenses have been considered, this company generated on about a 20% profit margin. In other words, if you think about yourself, most of us are um, employees, we work for somebody else. You have, do you have, I should ask, 20% of your, of your earnings, of what you earn in terms of a paycheck? Do you have 20% left at the end of the month? If you do, then you're a really good saver. Um, most of us couldn't say that we have that. Most of us, in fact, here at this stage of our lives, we're lucky if we can just break even, right? We're students. We're lucky if we can just cover our costs. But that means that this company has generated about 20% after all their expenses have been considered. What can they do with that? What you're going to find out when you start talking about corporations and 101, they have two choices. They can keep that inside the company for a rainy day or to expand or for any other reasons, or they can share it with the shareholders in the form of dividends. Right now, we're doing a sole proprietor. What can they do with that? They can either keep it inside their company capital, or they can distribute it out to the owner through the drawing process. That is, I believe, the hardest part of this chapter right there. That income statement was like no other income statement that we've seen in our short six weeks together. It's called multi-step for a reason. So I just want to go off to the side here somewhere and kind of break that statement down into what I would remember going into my 101 class. This is a series of chunks. And you're not going to find that word in the book. This is a series of chunks that we've been working at. Our first chunk was net sales. So I'm going to write down the skeleton format one more time because I want you to leave this class and go on to bigger and better things. Here's what I call the skeleton format. You'll see it on my agenda. 
But this is the mechanics that I go through to this day when I'm doing a multi-step income statement for a client or for myself, right? So here's the chunks that I use. Net sales is the first chunk. And I don't wanna make all these bigger. So let me make this a little bit smaller. There we go. Net sales, my second chunk, cost of goods sold. That's my hardest chunk. Gives me gross profit. I take out my operating expenses. That gives me income from operations. And I have to worry about the other section. And that's how I get down to net income. I can remember that going into a test. I can remember six or seven line items. And then you have to work at mechanically thinking through, oh, what does that chunk do? Oh yeah, that's the sales after deductions. Oh yeah, cost of goods sold, the hardest one. That's everything you buy tweaked for inventory and so on and so forth. That's how I would approach this. Questions on that? Okay, let's go back to our exercises that we were working on. And so 13-3, we did neatly a little bit ago. That is a 10 point test question, not the chicken scratching, a nice, neat statement. So here's what I would do. I would work on that homework problem. And I, if you have access to a printer, even if you don't, I would say that I would print out the solution to that exercise to have in my notes to look at. Even if you have to go save it on a USB drive and take it to Kinko's or take it to a Rite Aid or take it to a Staples and pay 10 or 15 cents to print that, I would print out that solution. It will help you with a large part of your exam. All right. Um, the statement of owner's equity has not changed at all. Let me show you before we do exercise 13-2, let me show you what a balance sheet is going to look like. Here's that income statement. Here's the balance sheet. So I wanna talk or note a couple of changes. Remember why we do a balance sheet, big picture. We do a balance sheet to show that assets equals liabilities plus equity. So I'm gonna refresh your memory because I can't write on that PDF file with the current setup I have. So the whole reason we do a balance sheet is to show that assets equals liabilities plus equity. That's why we do a balance sheet. So when we look at this big drawn out balance sheet, bigger picture perspective, we're proving that our assets equal our liabilities plus equity. Okay, so don't get lost in the detail. The only difference on this is that now we have a lot more assets than we had before because we keep expanding our vocabulary. So we're going to split them up. This is called a classified balance sheet. We're going to split the assets up between current and plant. Current assets, by definition, are those assets that we use up, if you want the, the wording from the book, those assets that are utilized or turned over within one year. That's what's going to change the classification. Current assets are those that are used up or are turned over within one year. So my cash is turning over every day. My accounts receivable, those turn over about every 30 to 60 days, right? My inventory is turning over daily. These prepaids, they're turning over definitely within one year's time. So that's the current assets. The plant and equipment assets are those long-lived or long-lived assets that last longer than a year. Um, you'll see some here, equipment, office equipment, building, land, those are all the long-term plant and equipment assets. Other than the length of it and the categories, these two categories, there's a couple more differences that I've notated out on your handout. Okay, here's the differences. I've been very intentional in pointing them out. 
So now that we have this new allowance account, GAAP says you have to show the net realizable value, what you realistically expect to collect. We learned about that allowance account in chapter 12. Now we're showing the presentation on the financial statements. So while this, though this company has 32,000 in receivables, it realistically expects to collect about 30,950. And with these depreciation, depreciated assets, GAAP expects you to show three things. I know this is a test question. The cost, the accumulated depreciation, and this thing called net book value, the difference between the two. So what can I tell? I can tell this equipment's pretty new. How can I tell that? Because the cost of the equipment's 30,000, but they've only started to depreciate it. It's only $2,400 depreciated. The net book value is the difference between the two, 27,600. You would see that for each category of assets, remember that land is not depreciated. It does not lose its usefulness, right? Even though we've been watching these crazy, horrific pictures of this building collapse, which just make my skin crawl just thinking about it, that land that all that building and stuff has collapsed onto, that land can be rebuilt upon again. It doesn't lose its usefulness. Moving down this balance sheet, liabilities are also classified into current and long-term. Again, the differentiating factor between the two is one year. This debt, all these debts that you see, and most of them come from payroll, all of these liabilities are due within one year. If you had like a mortgage that's due in 30 years, that would be listed as a long-term liability. And the owner's equity is never classified. It's still just one line that says capital. So having said that, I think we're ready to try another homework problem. Um, the balance sheet hasn't changed too much. It's just there's a lot more accounts now. What has changed is the categorization between current and plant assets on the asset side and between current and long-term liabilities on the debt side. No differentiation on capital. So again, this will lead itself to probably 10 to 20 points again in multiple choice questions. Can you class, can you properly classify these 15 assets that the author gave you? So here's the chunks right here. We're gonna work on classifying these, but before I do that, does anybody have any questions? Okay, accounts receivable. We know that's an asset. So now we're left with, is it a current or is it a plant and equipment? It's a current asset. Why accounts receivable turn over the vast majority of them within one year? The typical one goes 30 to 60 days. The truck is a property plan and equipment because that truck is gonna be around a year from now. It lasts longer than a year. So it's a property plan and equipment. I'm using PPE because that's what you hear out in practice and that's what you'll see on QuickBooks. Any prepaid is a current asset most of us don't pay for things more than a year ahead of time. A note payable due five years from now, that's a long-term liability. Office supplies, that's a current asset. My toner and my paper and pencils in here, I'm gonna use up within a year's time. Accounts payable, that's a current liability. They're due about every 30 to 60 days. My inventory is a current asset. It's gonna turn over within one year's time. Capital is never classified. It's just a regular owner's equity. So let me stop with the first half. 
And do you have any questions on one through eight? We're classifying these into what chunk of the balance sheet they'll go on to. Okay, cash is always a current asset. It's always the very first asset we list because it's the most liquid. And I'm gonna highlight this next one because so many people will miss it. Unearned, that's that one that we learned about in the last chapter. Any kind of an unearned is a current liability. Okay, that means when you get paid ahead of when you earn it, like a retainer for an attorney or a CPA. Okay, notes receivable. Um, I'm gonna use X2, assuming that we're in X1 right now, that would be a current asset. It's due within a year. If your book uses a later date, like X5, that would be a long-term, a plant and equipment. Accumulated truck. Accumulated depreciation on the truck is always a uh, plant and equipment. If the note payable was due in one year, that would be a current liability. Owner's equity accounts are never classified. I am going to remind you that that is a contra equity. And interest payable would be current liability. Interest payable, we learned about in the last chapter, that's where you may have some interest on a debt that is due. We have to accrue interest since the last payment date or from the time a note was signed in your case, what we learned. So can you guys classify things correctly? That'll be what I'm after. I won't have you doing a full-blown balance sheet. Um, I could, but I didn't ask you to do that. I will be asking you classification questions like this in multiple choice terms. Because of that, and because I think you're pretty well spent by now, um, we will do a statement of owner's equity, but I'm gonna send out the classified balance sheet. Um, so just to refresh your memory on what a statement of owner's equity looks like, because I, I it, it, there will be some multiple choice questions. First of all, nothing new. There's nothing new on this statement. It hasn't changed at all since you did it in one of the first few chapters. So I'm just gonna come off to the side so we don't have to go back and forth. And I'm gonna do a statement of owner's equity. You guys would have your who, what, when. I'm not gonna mess with that right now. We're gonna do a miniature statement of owner's equity just off to the side. And this would be for the income statement that we did earlier. Now, be aware, this, I remember this coming up too now. With our exercises, the, the income statement that we just did, that 13.3, they're connected with 13.4 and 13.5. The net income is gonna carry over. In connect, when you guys do the homework, they're going to throw different numbers at you. So when you do your statement of owner's equity, you'll have to co probably compute a new net income. So they won't carry over. They're independent. They're algorithmic of each other on the homework questions. Okay, let's push it out here. So we start off with the capital. Terry Lance, capital and this would be at the start of the year. So I'll go ahead and use 1-1 one, one of X1. Here's our format. I'm going to chicken scratch it out and then we'll go put the numbers in. We add net income and we take out the drawing. And that'll give us either a net increase or a net decrease. I don't know which. I guess I can look real quick. Actually, I don't know which. I'm going to leave a blank line because I'll go back and put that in. And that'll be Terry Lance Capital end of year. I'm going to give you guys a second or two to fill in these blanks here. Let's see if we can come up with the right ending capital. And then I'll do it with you in just a second.
Let's see if you guys can come up with it. All right, let's see. Beginning of the year was 68,760, pick a column. The net income that we got from 13.3, I'm gonna go grab, actually I can't grab it because it's on a different spreadsheet. So let me type that in, 52,025. That has an extra zero in it. The drawing they told me was 40,700. So the difference between what came in and what went out is a net increase. So now I can go type that word in. Now that I can see that what they brought in is bigger than what went out, we'll call this an increase in capital. And so Terry started with just over 68,000. She ended, when I add those up, with 80,085, as I mentioned to you earlier, most business owners are happy with any kind of an increase right now. We finally see businesses starting to come back to life. I don't know about you guys, but restaurants were packed this weekend here and in San Diego where I was. Hopefully we're getting back to some kind of normalcy, but let's still be careful. And then the one that I'm gonna put up as an answer and Giselle, I'm hoping maybe you can take a snapshot of it or something so you can send it out. What I wanna show you the answer for was the last one we're scheduled to do. Um, I hope I didn't take that away too fast. Let me put it up there one more time. The last one that we're scheduled to do is a classified balance sheet. Okay, remember what we're showing we're showing that assets equals liabilities plus equity. We went through on that last exercise, we took a look at what a classified balance sheet will look like. Um, we don't have time to do this one in class and I will not ask you to do this on a test. So for homework purposes, let me put up what your balance sheet's gonna look like and hopefully Giselle, Giselle, I might have to show this in uh, two snapshots because it's fairly long, we'll see. Give me one second. Okay, here is, I'll make this bigger, Giselle. Give me one second. Here is the asset section, if you can snap that. And here is the liability and equity section. Okay, what I want you guys to notice, there's two categories of assets. There's current assets and there's plant and equipment assets. The current assets are those assets that are turned over within a year's time. And the plant assets are those long lived or long lived assets. The new part, when you do accounts receivable, you'll have to list the net realizable value, what they'll realistically expect to collect and on the plant and equipment, you'll have to list three things which results in the assets book value. Example, this store equipment's fairly new. It costs them 11,200. They've only depreciated 1,180 of it. So I know it's new equipment. This is the book value of that equipment. As always, when we look at this balance sheet, the goal is to show that the assets equal the sum of the liabilities and the equity. 